Section 11 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 6, Renaissance and Reformation, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Michelangelo, Part 2. But Michelangelo did not paint many pieces. He confined himself chiefly to cartoons and designs, which, scattered far and wide, were reproduced by other artists. His most famous cartoon was The Battle of Pisa, the one executed for the ducal palace of florence as pendant to one by leonardo da vinci then in the height of his fame this picture was so remarkable for the accuracy of drawing and the variety and form of expression that raphael came to florence on purpose to study it and it was the power of giving boldness and dignity and variety to the human figure as shown in this painting which constitutes his great originality and transcendent excellence the great creations of the painters in modern times as well as in the ancient are those which represent the human figure in its ideal excellence which of course implies what is most perfect not in any one man or woman but in men and women collectively hence the greatest of painters rarely have stooped to landscaped painting since no imaginary landscape can surpass what everybody has seen in nature you cannot improve on the colors of the rainbow or the gilded clouds of sunset or the shadows of the mountain or the graceful form of trees or the varied tints of leaves and flowers but you can represent the figure of a man or woman more beautiful than any one man or woman that has ever appeared what mortal woman ever expressed the ethereal beauty depicted in a madonna of raphael or murillo and what man ever had such a sublimity of aspect and figure as the creations of michelangelo why a beggar says one of his greatest critics arose from his hand the patriarch of poverty the hump of his dwarf is impressed with dignity his infants are men and his men are giants and says another critic he is the inventor of epic painting in that sublime circle of the sistine chapel which exhibits the origin progress and final dispensation of the theocracy he has personified motion in the cartoon of pisa portrayed meditation in the prophets and sibyls of the sistine chapel and in the last judgment traced every attitude which varies the human body with every passion which sways the human soul his supremacy is in the mighty soaring of his intellectual conceptions marvelous as a creator like shakespeare profound and solemn like dante representing power even in repose and giving to the cyclopean forms which he has called into being a charm of moral excellence which secures our sympathy a firm believer in a supreme and personal god disciplined in worldly trials and glowing in lofty conceptions of justice he delights in portraying the stern prophets of israel surrounded with an atmosphere of holiness yet breathing compassion on those whom they denounce august in dignity yet melting with tenderness solemn sad profound thus was his influence pure and exalted in an art which has too often been prostituted to please the perverted taste of a sensual age the most refined and expressive of all the arts as it sometimes is and always should be is the one which oftenest appeals to that which christianity teaches us to shun you may say evil to him who evil thinks especially ye pure and immaculate persons who have walked uncorrupted amid the galleries of paris dresden florence and rome but i fancy that pictures like books are what we choose to make them and that the more exquisite the art by which vice is divested of its grossness but not of its subtle poisons like the new eloise of rousseau or the wilhelm meister of goethe the more fatally will it lead astray by the insidious entrance of an evil spirit in the guise of an angel of light art like literature is neither good nor evil abstractly but may become a savor of death unto death as well as of life unto life you cannot extinguish it without destroying one of the noblest developments of civilization but you cannot have civilization without multiplying the temptations of human society and hence must be guarded from those destructive cankers which as in old rome eat out the virtues on which the strength of man is based the old apostles and other great benefactors of the world attached more value to the truths which elevate than to the arts which soften it was the noble direction which michael angelo gave to art which made him a great benefactor not only of civilization but also of art by linking with it the eternal ideas of majesty and dignity as well as the truths which are taught by divine inspiration another illustration of the profound reverence which the great masters of the world like augustine pascal and bacon have ever expressed for the ideas which were revealed by christianity and the old prophets of jehovah ideas which many bright but inferior intellects in their egotistical arrogance have sought to subvert 
yet it was neither as sculptor nor painter that michelangelo left the most enduring influence but as architect painting and sculpture are the exclusive ornaments and possession of the rich and favored but architecture concerns all men and most men have something to do with it in the course of their lives what boots it that a man pays two thousand pounds for a picture to be shut up in his library and probably more valued for its rarity or from the caprices of fashion than for its real merits but it is something when a nation pays a million for a ridiculous building without regard to the object for which it is intended to be observed and criticized by everybody and for succeeding generations a good picture is the admiration of a few a magnificent edifice is the pride of thousands a picture necessarily cultivates the taste of a family circle a public edifice educates the minds of millions even the moses of michelangelo is a mere object of interest to those who visit the church of san pietro in vincoli but st peter's is a monument to be seen by large populations from generation to generation all london contemplates st paul's church or the palace of westminster but the national gallery may be visited by a small fraction of the people only once a year of the thousands who stand before the tuileries or the madeleine not one in a hundred has visited the gallery of the louvre what material works of man so grand as those hoary monuments of piety or pride erected three thousand years ago and still magnificent in their very ruins how imposing are the pyramids the Colosseum, and the gothic cathedrals of the middle ages and even when architecture does not rear vaulted roofs and arches and pinnacles or tower to dazzling heights or inspire reverential awe from the associations which cluster around it how interesting are even its minor triumphs who does not stop to admire a beautiful window or porch or portico who does not criticize his neighbor's house its proportions its general effect its adaptation to the uses designed architecture never wearies us for its wonders are inexhaustible they appeal to the common eye and have reference to the necessities of man and sometimes express the consecrated sentiments of an age or a nation nor can it be prostituted like painting and sculpture it never corrupts the mind and sometimes inspires it and if it makes an appeal to the senses or the imagination it is to kindle perceptions of the severe beauty of geometrical forms whoever then has done anything in architecture has contributed to the necessities of man and stimulated an admiration for what is venerable and magnificent now michelangelo was not only the architect of numerous palaces and churches but also one of the principal architects of that great edifice which is on the whole the noblest church in christendom a perpetual marvel and study not faultless but so imposing that it will long remain like the old temple of ephesus one of the wonders of the world he completed the church without great deviation from the plan of the first architect bramante whom he regarded as the greatest architect that had lived altering bramante's plan from a latin to a greek cross the former of which was retained after michelangelo's death but it is the interior rather than the exterior of st peter's which shows its vast superiority over all other churches for splendor and effect and surprises all who are even fresh from cologne and milan and westminster it impresses us like a wonder of nature rather than as the work of man a great work of engineering as well as a marvel of majesty and beauty we are surprised to see so vast a structure covering nearly five acres so elaborately finished nothing neglected the lofty walls covered with precious marbles the side chapels filled with statues and monuments the altars ornamented with pictures and those pictures not painted in oil but copied in mosaic so that they will neither decay nor fade but last till destroyed by violence what feelings overpower the poetic mind when the glories of that interior first blaze upon the brain what a world of brightness softness and richness what grandeur solidity and strength what unnumbered treasures around the altars what grand mosaics relieve the height of the wondrous dome larger than the pantheon rising two hundred feet from the intersection of those lofty and massive piers which divide the transept from choir and nave what effect of magnitude after the eye gets accustomed to the vast proportions oh what silence reigns around how difficult even for the sonorous chants of choristers and priests to disturb that silence to be more than echoes of a distant music which seems to come from the very courts of heaven itself to some a holy sanctuary where one may meditate among crowds and feel alone where one breathes an atmosphere which changes not with heat or cold and where the ever-burning lamps and clouds of incense diffusing the fragrance of the east and the rich dresses of the mitred priests and the unnumbered symbols suggest the ritualism of that imposing worship when solomon dedicated to jehovah the grandest temple of antiquity truly was st peter's church the last great achievement of the popes 
the crowning demonstration of their temporal dominion suggestive of their wealth and power a marble history of pride and pomp a fitting emblem of that worship which appeals to sense rather than to god and singular it was when the great artist reared that gigantic pile even though it symbolized the cross he really gave a vital wound to that cause to which he consecrated his noblest energies for its lofty dome could not be completed without the contributions of christendom and those contributions could not be made without an appeal to false principles which centered into medieval catholicism even penance and self-expiation which stirred the holy indignation of a man who knew and declared on what different ground justification should be based thus was luther in one sense called into action by the labors of michelangelo thus was the erection of st peter's church overruled in the preaching of reformers who would show that the money obtained by the sale of indulgences for sin could never purchase an acceptable offering to god even though the monument were filled with christian emblems and consecrated by those prayers and anthems which had been the life of blessed saints and martyrs for more than a thousand years st peter's is not gothic it is a restoration of the greek it belongs to what artists call the renaissance a style of architecture marked by a return to the classical models of antiquity michelangelo brought back to civilization the old ideas of grecian grace and roman majesty typical of the original inspirations of the men who lived in the quiet admiration of eternal beauty and grace men who built the parthenon and who shaped pillars and capitals and entablatures in the severest proportions and fitted them with ornaments drawn from the living world plants and animals especially images of god's highest work even of man and of man not worn and macerated and dismal and monstrous but of man when most resplendent in the perfections of the primeval strength and beauty he returned to a style which classical antiquity carried to great perfection but which had been neglected by the new teutonic nations nor is there evidence that michelangelo disdained the creations especially seen in those gothic monuments which are still the objects of our admiration who does not admire the church architecture of the middle ages of its kind it has never been surpassed geometry and art the true and the beautiful meet nothing ever erected by the hand of man surpasses the more famous cathedrals of the twelfth and thirteenth centuries in richness and variety of their symbolic decorations they typify the great ideas of christianity they inspire feelings of awe and reverence they are astonishing structures in their magnitude and in their effect monuments are they of religious zeal and poetical inspiration the creations of great artists although we scarcely know their names adapted to the uses designed the expression of consecrated sentiments the marble history of the ages in which they were erected now heavy and sombre when society was enslaved and mournful and then cheerful and lofty when christianity was joyful and triumphant whoever was satisfied in contemplating the diversified wonders of those venerable structures who would lose the impression which almost overwhelmed the mind when york minster or cologne or milan or amiens was first beheld with their lofty spires and towers their sculptured pinnacles their flying buttresses their vaulted roofs their long arcades their purple windows their holy altars their symbolic carvings their majestic outlines their grand proportions but beautiful imposing poetical and venerable as are these hoary piles they are not the all in all of art suppose all the buildings of europe the last four hundred years had been modelled from those churches how gloomy would be our streets how dark and dingy our shops how dismal our dwellings how inconvenient our hotels a new style was needed at least as a supplement of the old as lances and shields were giving place to firearms and the line and the plummet for the mariner's compass as a new civilization was creating new wants and developing the material necessities of man so michael angelo arose and revived the imperishable models of the classical ages to be applied not merely to churches but to palaces civic halls theatres libraries museums banks all of which have mundane purposes the material world had need of conveniences as much as the medieval age had need of shrines humanity was to be developed as well as the deity was to be worshipped the artist took the broadest views looking upon gothic architecture as but one division of art even as truth is greater than any system and christianity wider than any sect oh how this shakespeare of art would have smiled on the vague and transcendental panegyrics of michelet or ruskin and other sentimental admirers of an age which can never return and how he might have laughed at some modern enthusiasts who trace religion to the disposition of stones and arches forgetting that religion is an inspiration which comes from god and never from the work of man's hands which can be only a form of idolatry michelangelo found that the ornamentations of the ancient temples were as rich and varied as those of medieval churches 
moldings were discovered of incomparable elegance the figures on entablatures were found to be chiseled accurately from nature the pillars were of matchless proportions the capitals of graceful curvatures he saw beauty in the horizontal lines of the parthenon as much as in the vertical lines of cologne he would not pull down the venerable monuments of religious zeal but he would add to them because the pointed arch was sacred he would not despise the humble office of the lintel and in southern climates especially there was no need of those steep gothic roofs which were intended to prevent a great weight of rain and snow and where the graceful portico of the greeks was more appropriate than the heavy tower of the lombards he would seize on everything that the genius of the past ages had endorsed even as christianity itself appropriates everything human science art music poetry eloquence literature sanctifies it and dedicates it to the lord not for the pride of priests but for the improvement of humanity civilization may exist with paganism but only performs its highest uses when tributary to christianity and christianity accepts the tribute which even pagan civilization offers for the adornment of our race expelled from paradise and doomed to hard and bitter toils without abdicating her more glorious office of raising the soul to heaven nor was michael angelo responsible for the vile mongrel architecture which followed the renaissance and which defigures the modern capitals of europe any more than for the perversion of painting in the hands of titian but the indiscriminate adoption of pillars for humble houses shops with roman arches spires and towers erected on grecian porticos are no worse than schoolhouses built like convents and chapels designed for preaching as much as for choral chants made dark and gloomy where the voice of the preachers lost and wasted amid vaulted roofs and useless pillars michael angelo encouraged no incongruities he himself conceived the beautiful and the true and admired it wherever found even amid the excavations of ruined cities he may have overrated the buried monuments of ancient art but how was he to escape the universal enthusiasm of his age for the remains of a glorious and forgotten civilization perhaps his mind was wearied with the middle ages from which he had nothing more to learn and sought a greater fullness and a more perfect unity in the expanding forces of a new and grander era than was ever seen by pagan heroes or by gothic saints but i need not expatiate on the new ideas which michael angelo accepted or the impulse he gave to art in all its forms and to the revival of which civilization is so much indebted let us turn and give a parting look at the man that great creative genius who had no superior in his day and generation like the greatest of all italians he is interesting for his grave experiences his dreary isolations his vast attainments his creative imagination and his lofty moral sentiments like dante he stands apart from and superior to all other men of his age he could never sport with jesters or laugh with buffoons or chat with fools and because of this he seemed to be haughty and disdainful like luther he had no time for frivolities and looked upon himself as commissioned to do important work he rejoiced in labor and knew no rest until he was eighty-nine he ate that he might live not lived that he might eat for seventeen years after he was seventy-two he worked on st peter's church worked without pay that he might render to god his last earthly tribute without alloy as religious as those unknown artists who erected reims and westminster he was modest and patient yet could not submit to the insolence of little men in power he even left the papal palace in disdain when he found his labors unappreciated julius the second was forced to bend to the stern artist not the artist to the pope yet when leo the tenth sent him to quarry marbles for nine years he submitted without complaint he had no craving for riches like rubens no love of luxury like raphael no envy like da vinci he never overtasked his brain or suffered himself like raphael who died exhausted at thirty-seven to crowd three days into one knowing that overwork exhausts the nervous energies and shortens life he never attempted to open the doors which providence had plainly shut against him but waited patiently for his day knowing it would come yet whether it came or not it was all the same to him a man with all the holy rapture of a kepler and all the glorious self-reliance of a newton he was indeed jealous of his fame but he was not greedy of admiration he worked without the stimulus of praise one of the rarest things urged on purely by love of art he loved art for its own sake as good men love virtue as palestrina loved music as bacon loved truth as kant loved philosophy satisfied with itself as its own reward he disliked to be patronized but always remembered benefits and loved the tribute of respect and admiration even as he scorned the empty flatterer of fashion he was the soul of sincerity as well as of magnanimity and hence had great capacity for friendship as well as great power of self-sacrifice 
his friendship with victoria colonna is as memorable as that of jerome and paola or that of hildebrand and the countess matilda he was a great patriot and clung to his native florence with peculiar affection living in habits of intimacy with princes and cardinals he never addressed them in adulatory language but talked and acted like a nobleman of nature whose inborn and superior greatness could be tested only by the ages he placed on art the highest pinnacle of the temple of humanity but dedicated that temple to the god of heaven in whom he believed his person was not commanding but intelligence radiated from his features and his earnest nature commanded respect in childhood he was feeble but temperance made him strong he believed that no bodily decay was incompatible with intellectual improvement he continued his studies until he died and felt that he had mastered nothing he was always dissatisfied with his own productions excelsior was his motto as alp on alp arose upon his view his studies were diversified and vast he wrote poetry as well as carved stone his sonnets especially holding a high rank he was engineer as well as architect and fortified florence against her enemies when old he showed all the fire of youth and his eye like that of moses never became dim since his strength and his beauty were of the soul ever expanding ever adoring his temper was stern but affectionate he had no mercy on a fool or a dunce and turned in disgust from those who loved trifles and lies he was guilty of no immoralities like raphael and titian being universally venerated for his stern integrity and allegiance to duty as one who believes that there really is a god to whom he is personally responsible he gave away his riches like ambrose and gregory valuing money only as a means of usefulness sickened with the world he still labored for the world and died in fifteen sixty four over eighty-nine years of age in the full assurance of eternal blessedness in heaven his marbles may crumble down in spite of all that we can do to preserve them as models of hopeless imitation but the exalted ideas he sought to represent by them are imperishable and divine and will be subjects of contemplation when seas shall waste the skies to smoke decay rocks fall to dust and mountains melt away authorities grimm's life of michael angelo vasari's lives of the most excellent painters sculptors and architects dupa's life of michael angelo bale's histoire de la peinture en ital end of section 11section 12 of beacon lights of history volume 6 renaissance and reformation by john lord this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand martin luther part 1 ad 1483 to 1546 the protestant reformation among great benefactors martin luther is one of the most illustrious he headed the protestant reformation this movement is so completely interlinked with the literature the religion the education the prosperity yea even the political history of europe that it is the most important and interesting of all modern historical changes it is a subject of such amazing magnitude that no one can claim to be well informed who does not know its leading issues and developments as it spread from germany to switzerland france holland sweden england and scotland the central and prominent figure in the movement is luther but the way was prepared for him by a host of illustrious men in different countries by savonarola in italy by huss and jerome in bohemia by erasmus in holland by wycliffe in england and by sundry others who detested the corruptions they ridiculed and lamented but could not remove how flagrant those evils who can deny them the papal despotism and the frauds on which it was based monastic corruptions penance and indulgences for sin and the sale of them more shameful still the secular character of the clergy the pomp wealth and arrogance of bishops auricular confession celibacy of the clergy their idle and dissolute lives their ignorance and superstition the worship of the images of saints and masses for the dead the gorgeous ritualism of the mass the substitution of legends for the scriptures which were not translated or read by the people pilgrimages processions idle pomps and the multiplication of holy days above all the grinding spiritual despotism exercised by priests with their inquisitions and excommunications all centering in the terrible usurpation of the popes keeping the human mind in bondage and suppressing all intellectual independence these evils prevailed everywhere i say nothing here of the massacres the poisonings the assassinations the fornications the abominations of which history accuses many of the pontiffs who sat on papal thrones such evils did not stare the german and english in their face as they did the italians in the fifteenth century 
in germany the vices were medieval and monkish not the unblushing infidelity and levities of the renaissance which made a radical reformation in italy impossible in germany and england there was left among the people the power of conscience a rough earnestness of character the sense of moral accountability and a fear of divine judgment luther was just the man for his work sprung from the people poor popular fervent educated amid privations religious by nature yet with exuberant animal spirits dogmatic boisterous intrepid with a great insight into realities practical untiring learned generally cheerful and hopeful emancipated from the terrors of the middle ages scorning the middle ages progressive in his spirit lofty in his character earnest in his piety believing in the future and in god such was the great leader of this emancipating movement he was not so learned as erasmus nor so logical as calvin nor so scholarly as melanchthon nor so broad as cranmer he was not a polished man he was often offensively rude and brusque and lavish of epithets nor was he what we call a modest and humble man he was intellectually proud disdainful and sometimes when irritated abusive none of his pictures represent him as a refined-looking man scarcely intellectual but coarse and sensual rather as socrates seemed to the athenians but with these defects and drawbacks he had just such traits and gifts as fitted him to lead a great popular movement bold audacious with deep convictions and rapid intellectual processes prompt decided kind-hearted generous brave in sympathy with the people eloquent herculean in energies with an amazing power of work electrical in his smile and in his words and always ready for contingencies had he been more polished more of a gentleman more fastidious more scrupulous more ascetic more modest he would have shrunk from his tasks he would have lost the elasticity of his mind he would have become discouraged even st augustine a broader and more catholic man than luther could not have done his work he was a sort of converted mirabeau he loved the storms of battle he impersonated revolutionary ideas but he was a man of thought as well as of action luther's origin was of the humblest born in eiselben november tenth fourteen eighty three the son of a poor peasant his childhood was spent in penury he was religious from a boy he was religious when he sang hymns for a living from house to house before the people of mansfield while at school there and also at the schools of magdeburg and eisenach where he still earned his bread by his voice his devotional character and his music gained for him a friend who helped him through his studies till at the age of eighteen he entered the university at erfurt where he distinguished himself in the classics and the mediaeval philosophy and here his religious meditations led him to enter the augustinian monastery he entered that strict retreat as others did to lead a religious life the great question of all time pressed upon his mind with peculiar force what shall a man give in exchange for his soul and it shows that religious life in germany still burned in many a heart in spite of the corruptions of the church that a young man like luther should seek the shades of monastic seclusion for meditation and study he was a monk like other monks but it seems he had religious doubts and fears more than ordinary monks at first he conformed to the customary ways of men seeking salvation he walked in the beaten road like saint dominic and saint francis he accepted the great ideas of the middle ages which he was afterwards to repudiate he was not beyond them or greater than they were at first he fasted like monks and tormented his body with austerities as they did from the time of benedict he sang in the choir from early morn and practised the usual severities but his doubts and fears remained he did not like other monks seek peace and consolation he did not become seraphic like saint francis or bonaventura or loyola perhaps his nature repelled asceticism perhaps his inquiring and original mind wanted something better and surer to rest upon than the dreams and visions of a traditional piety perhaps his inquiring and original mind wanted something better and surer to rest upon than the dreams and visions of a traditionary piety had he been satisfied with the ordinary mode of propitiating the deity he would have never emerged from his retreat to his scholar the monastery had great attractions even in that age it was still invested with poetic associations and consecrated usages it was endorsed by the venerable fathers of the church it was favorable to study and free from the noisy turmoil of the world but with all these advantages luther was miserable he felt the agonies of an unforgiven soul in quest of peace with god he could not get rid of them they pursued him into the immensity of an intolerable night he was in despair what could austerities do for him 
he hungered and thirsted after the truth like st augustine in milan he had no taste for philosophy but he wanted the repose that philosophers pretended to teach he was then too narrow to read plato or bothius he was a self-tormented monk without relief he suffered all that st paul suffered at tarsus in some respects this monastic pietism resembled the phariseeanism of saul in the school of tarsus a technical rigid and painful adherence to rules fastings obtrusive prayers and petty ritualisms which form the essence and substance of all phariseeism and all monastic life based on the enormous error that man deserves heaven by external practices in which however he can never perfect himself though he were to live like simeon stylites on the top of a pillar for twenty years without once descending an eternal unrest because perfection cannot be attained the most terrible slavery to which a man can be conscientiously doomed verging into hypocrisy and fanaticism it was then that a kind and enlightened friend visited him and recommended him to read the bible the bible never has been a sealed book to monks it was ever highly prized no convent was without it but it was read with the spectacles of the middle ages repentance meant penance in st paul's epistles luther discovers the true ground of justification not works but faith for paul had passed through similar experiences works are good but faith is the gift of god works are imperfect with the best of men even the highest form of works to a medieval eye self-expiation and penance but faith is infinite radiating from divine love faith is a boundless joy salvation by the grace of god his everlasting and precious boon to people who cannot climb to heaven on their hands and knees the highest gift which god ever bestowed on men eternal life luther is thus emancipated from the ideas of the middle ages and of the old syriac monks and of the jewish pharisees in his deliverance he has new hopes and aspirations he becomes cheerful and devotes himself to his studies nothing can make a man more cheerful and joyful than the cordial reception of a gift which is infinite a blessing which is too priceless to be bought the pharisee the monk the ritualist is gloomy ascetic severe intolerant for he is not quite sure of his salvation a man who accepts heaven as a gift is full of divine enthusiasm like saint augustine luther now comprehends augustine the great doctor of the church embraces his philosophy and sees how much it has been misunderstood the rare attainments and interesting character of luther are at last recognized he is made a professor of divinity in the new university which the elector of saxony has endowed at wittenberg he becomes a favorite with the students he enters into the life of the people he preaches with wonderful power for he is popular earnest original fresh electrical he is a monk still but the monk is merged in the learned doctor and eloquent preacher he does not yet even dream of attacking monastic institutions or the pope he is a good catholic in his obedience to authorities but he hates the middle ages and all their ghostly funereal burdensome and technical religious customs he is human almost convivial fond of music of poetry of society of friends and of the good cheer of the social circle the people love luther for he has a broad humanity they never did love monks only feared their maledictions about this time the pope was in great need of money this was leo the tenth he not only squandered his vast revenues in pleasures and pomps like any secular monarch he not only collected pictures and statues but he wanted to complete st peter's church it was the crowning glory of papal magnificence where was he to get money except from the contributions of christendom but kings and princes and bishops and abbots were getting tired of this everlasting drain of money to rome in the shape of annats and taxes so leo revived an old custom of the dark ages he would sell indulgences for sin and he sent his agents to peddle them in every country the agent in saxony was a very vulgar boisterous noisy bullying dominican by the name of tetzel luther abhorred him not so much because he was vulgar and noisy but because his infamous business derogated from the majesty of god and religion in wrathful indignation he preached against tetzel and his practices the abominable traffic of indulgences only god can forgive sins it seemed to him to be an insult to the human understanding that any man even a pope should grant an absolution for crime these indulgences were the very worst form of penance since they made a mockery of virtue and it was useless to preach against them so long as the principles on which they were based were not assailed everybody believed in penance everybody believed that this in some form would ensure salvation 
it consisted in a temporal penalty or punishment inflicted on the sinner after confession to the priest as a condition of his receiving absolution or an authoritative pardon of his sin by the church as god's representative and the indulgence was originally an official remission of this penalty to be gained by offerings of money to the church for its sacred uses however ingenious this theory the practice inevitably ran into corruption the people who bought the agents who sold the popes who dispensed these indulgences used them for the vilest purposes fortunately in those times in germany everybody felt he had a soul to save neither the popes nor the church ever lost that idea the clergy ruled by its force by stimulating fears of divine wrath whereby the wretched sinner would be physically tormented for ever unless he escaped by a propitiation of the deity deeds of supererogation donations to the church self-expiation works of fear and penitence which commanded themselves to the piety of the age and this piety luther now believed to be unenlightened not the kind enjoined by christ or paul so to instruct his students and the people as to the true ground of justification which he had worked out from the study of the bible and saint augustine amid the agonies of a tormented conscience luther prepared his thesis those celebrated ninety-five propositions which he affixed to the gates of the church at wittenberg and which excited a great sensation throughout northern germany even reaching the eyes of the pope himself who did not comprehend their tendency but was struck with their power this dr luther said he is a man of fine genius the students of the university and the people generally were kindled as if by pentecostal fires the new invention of printing scattered those theses everywhere far and near they reached the humble hamlet as well as the palaces of bishops and princes they excited immediate and immense enthusiasm there was freshness in them originality and great ideas we cannot wonder at the enthusiasm which those religious ideas excited nearly four hundred years ago when we reflect that they were not cant words then not worn-out platitudes not dead dogmas but full of life and exciting interest even as were the watchwords of rousseau liberty fraternity equality to the frenchmen on the outbreak of their political revolution and as those watchwords abstractly true roused the dormant energies of the french to a terrible conflict against feudalism and royalty so those theses of luther kindled germany into a living flame and why because they presented more cheerful and comforting grounds of justification than had been preached for one thousand years faith rather than penance for works hinged on penance the underlying principle of those propositions was grace divine grace to save the world the principle of paul and saint augustine therefore not new but forgotten a mighty comfort to miserable people mocked and cheated and robbed by a venal and a gluttonous clergy even taine admits that this doctrine of grace is the foundation stone of protestantism as it spread over europe in the sixteenth century in those places where protestantism is dead where rationalism or pelagian speculations have taken its place this fact may be denied but the history of northern europe blazes with it a fact which no historian of any honesty can deny very likely those who are not in sympathy with this great idea of luther augustine and paul may ignore the fact even as caleb gushing once declared to me that the reformation sprang from the desire of luther to marry catherine bora and that learned and ingenious sophist overwhelmed me with his citations from infidel and ribald catholic writers like Auden. greater men than he deny that grace underlies the whole original movement of the reformers and they talk of the reformation as a mere revolt from rome as a war against papal corruption as a protest against monkery and the dark ages brought about by the spirit of a new age the onward march of humanity the necessary progress of society i admit the secondary causes of the reformation which are very important the awakened spirit of inquiry in the sixteenth century the revival of poetry and literature and art the breaking up of feudalism fortunate discoveries the introduction of greek literature the renaissance the disgusts of christendom the voice of martyrs calling aloud from their funeral pyres yea the friendly hand of princes and scholars deploring the evils of a corrupted church but how much had savonarola or erasmus or john huss or the lollards aroused the enthusiasm of europe great and noble as were their angry and indignant protests the genius of the reformation in its early stages was a religious movement not a political or a moral one although it became both political and moral its strength and fervor were in the new ideas of salvation the same that gave power to the early preachers of christianity 
not denunciations of imperialism and slavery and ten thousand evils which disgraced the empire but the proclamation of the ideas of paul as to the grounds of hope when the soul should leave the body the salvation of the lord declared to a world in bondage luther kindled the same religious life among the masses that the apostles did the same that wycliffe did and by the same means the declaration of salvation by belief in the incarnate son of god shedding his blood in infinite love why see how this idea spread through germany switzerland and france and took possession of the minds of the english and scotch yeomanry with all their stern and earnest ruggedness see how it was elaborately expanded by calvin how it gave birth to a new and strong theology how it entered into the very life of the people especially among the puritans into the souls of even cromwell's soldiers what made the pilgrim's progress the most popular book ever published in england because it reflected the theology of the age the religion of the people all based on luther's theses the revival of those old doctrines which converted the roman provinces from paganism i do not care if these statements are denied by catholics or rationalists or progressive savants what is it to me that the old views have become unfashionable or are derided or are dead in the absorbing materialism of this epicurean yet brilliant age i know this that i am true to history when i declare that the glorious reformation in which we all profess to rejoice and which is the greatest movement and the best of our modern time susceptible of indefinite application interlinked with the literature and the progress of england and america took its first great spiritual start from the ideas of luther as to justification this was the voice of heaven's messenger proclaiming aloud so that the heavens re-echoed to the glorious and triumphant annunciation and the earth heard and rejoiced with exceeding joy behold i send tidings of salvation it is grace divine grace which shall undermine the thrones of popes and pagans and reconcile a fallen world to god yes it was a christian philosopher a theologian a doctor of divinity working out in his cell and study through terrible internal storm and anguish and against the whole teaching of monks and bishops and popes and universities from the time of charlemagne the same truth which augustine learned in his wonderful experiences who started the reformation in the right direction who became the greatest benefactor of these modern times because he based his work on everlasting and positive ideas which had life in them and hope and the sanction of divine authority thus virtually invoking the aid of god almighty to bring about and restore the true glory of his church on earth a glory forever to be identified with the death of his son i see no law of progress here no natural and necessary development of nations i see only the light and power of individual genius brushing away the cobwebs and sophistries and frauds of the middle ages and bringing out to the gaze of europe the vital truth which with supernatural aid made in old times the day of pentecost and i think i hear the emancipated people of saxony exclaim from the elector downwards if these ideas of dr luther are true and we feel them to be then all our penances have been worse than wasted we have been pagans away with our miserable efforts to scale the heavens let us accept what we cannot buy let us make our palaces and our cottages alike vocal with the praises of him whom we now accept as our deliverer our king and our eternal lord thus was born the first great idea of the reformation out of luther's brain out of his agonized soul and sent forth to conquer and produce changes most marvellous to behold it is not my object to discuss the truth or error of this fundamental doctrine there are many who deny it even among protestants i am not a controversialist or a theologian i am simply an historian i wish to show what is historically true and clear and i defy all the scholars and critics of the world to prove that this doctrine is not the basal pillar of the reformation of luther i wish to make emphatic the statement that justification by faith was as a historical fact the great primal idea of luther not new but new to him and to his age i have now to show how this idea led to others how they became connected together how they produced not only a spiritual movement but political moral and intellectual forces until all europe was in a blaze thus far the agitation under luther had been chiefly theological it was not a movement against popes or institutions it was not even the vehement denunciation against sin in high places which inflamed the anger of the pope against savonarola to some it doubtless seems like the old controversy between augustine and pelagius like the contentions between dominican and franciscan monks but it was too important to escape the attention of even leo x although at first he gave it no thought 
it was a dangerous agitation it had become popular there was no telling where it would end or what it might not assail it was deemed necessary to stop the mouth of this bold and intellectual saxon theologian so the voluptuous infidel elegant pope accomplished in manners and pagan arts and literature sent one of the most learned men of the church which called him father to argue with dr luther confute him conquer him deeming this an easy task but the doctor could not be silenced his convictions were grounded on the rock not on peter but on the rock from which peter derived his name all the papal legates and cardinals in the world could neither convince nor frighten him he courted argument he challenged the whole church to refute him then the schools took up the controversy all that was imposing in names in authority in traditions in associations was arrayed against him they came down upon him with the whole array of scholastic learning the great goliath of controversy in that day was dr eck who challenged the saxon monk to a public disputation at leipzig all germany was interested the question at issue stirred the nation to its very depths the disputants met in the great hall of the palace of the elector never before was seen in germany such an array of doctors and theologians and dignitaries it rivalled in importance and dignity the council of nice when the great constantine presided to settle the trinitarian controversy the combatants were as great as athanasius and arius as vehement as earnest though not so fierce dr eck was superior to luther in reputation in dialectical skill in scholastic learning he was the pride of the universities luther however had deeper convictions more genius greater eloquence and at that time he was modest the champion of the schools of sophistries and authorities of dead letter literature of quibbles refinements and words soon overwhelmed the saxon monk with his citations decrees of councils opinions of eminent ecclesiastics the literature of the church its mighty authority he was on the eve of triumph had the question been settled as dr eck supposed by authorities as lawyers and pedants would settle the question luther would have been beaten but his genius came to his aid in the consciousness of truth he swept away the premises of the argument he denied the supreme authority of popes and councils and universities he appealed to the scriptures as the only ultimate ground of authority he did not deny authority but appealed to it in its highest form this was unexpected ground the church was not prepared openly to deny the authority of saint paul or saint peter and luther if he did not gain his case was far from being beaten and what was of vital importance to his success he had the elector and the people with him end of section 12section thirteen of beacon lights of history volume six renaissance and reformation by john lord this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand martin luther part two thus was born the second great idea of the reformation the supreme authority of the scriptures to which protestants of every denomination have since professed to cling they may differ in the interpretation of texts and thus sects and parties gradually arose who quarrelled about their meaning but none of them deny their supreme authority all the issues of protestants have been on the meaning of texts on the interpretation of the scriptures to be settled by learning and reason it was not until rationalism arose and rejected plain and obvious declarations of scripture as inconsistent with reason as interpolations as uninspired that the authority of the scriptures was weakened and these rationalists and the land of luther became full of them have gone on infinitely beyond the catholics in undermining the bible the catholics never have taken such bold ground as the rationalists respecting the scriptures the catholic church still accepts the bible but explains away the meaning of many of its doctrines the rationalists would sweep away its divine authority extinguish faith and leave the world in night satan came into the theological school of the protestants disguised in the robes of learned doctors searching for truth and took away the props of religious faith this was worse than baptizing repentance with the name of penance better have irrational fears of hell than no fears at all for this latter is paganism pagan culture and pagan philosophy could not keep society together in the old roman world but medieval appeals to the fears of men did keep them from crimes and force upon them virtues the triumph of luther at leipzig was however incomplete the catholics rallied after their stunning blow they said in substance we too accept the scriptures we even put them above augustine and thomas aquinas and the councils but who can interpret them can peasants and women or even merchants and nobles 
the bible though inspired is full of difficulties there are contradictory texts it is a sealed book except to the learned only the church can reconcile its difficulties and what we mean by the church is the clergy the learned clergy acknowledging allegiance to their spiritual head who in matters of faith is also infallible we can accept nothing which is not endorsed by popes and councils no matter how plain the scriptures seem to be on certain disputed points only the authority of the church can enlighten and instruct us we distrust reason that is what you call reason for reason can twist anything and pervert it but what the church says is true its collective intelligence is our supreme law thus putting papal dogmas above reason above the literal and plain declarations of scripture moreover since the scriptures are to be interpreted only by priests it is not a safe book for the people we the priests will keep it out of their hands they will get notions from it fatal to our authority they will become fanatics they will in their conceit defy us then luther rose more powerful more eloquent more majestic than before he rose superior to himself what said he keep the light of life from the people take away their guide to heaven keep them in ignorance of what is most precious and most exalting deprive them of the blessed consolations which sustain the soul in trial and in death deny the most palpable truths because your dignitaries put on them a construction to bolster up their power what an abomination what treachery to heaven what peril to the souls of men besides your authorities differ augustine takes different ground from pelagius bernard from abelard thomas aquinas from dun scotus have not your grand councils given contradictory decisions whom shall we believe yea the popes themselves your infallible guides have they not at different times rendered different decisions what would gregory the first say to the verdicts of gregory the seventh no the scriptures are the legacy of the early church to universal humanity they are the equal and treasured inheritance of all nations and tribes and kindreds upon the face of the earth and will be till the day of judgment it was intended that they should be diffused and that every one should read them and interpret them each for himself for he has a soul to save and he dare not entrust such a precious thing as his soul into the keeping of selfish and ambitious priests take away the bible from a peasant or a woman or any layman and cannot the priest armed with the terrors and the frauds of the middle ages shut up his soul in a gloomy dungeon and as noisome and funereal as your mediaeval crypts and will you ye boasted intellectual guides of the people extinguish reason in this world in reference to the most momentous interests what other guide has a man but his reason and you would prevent this very reason from being enlightened by the gospel you would obscure reason itself by your traditions o ye blind leaders of the blind o ye legal and technical men obscuring the light of truth o ye miserable pharisees ye bigots ye selfish priests tenacious of your power your inventions your traditions will ye withhold the free redemption god's greatest boon salvation by the blood of christ offered to all the world yea will you suffer the people to perish soul and body because you fear that instructed by god himself they will rebel against your accursed despotism have you considered what a mighty crime you thus commit against god against man ye rule by an infernal appeal to the superstitious fears of men but how shall ye yourselves for such crimes escape the damnation of that hell into which you would push your victims unless they obey you no i say let the scriptures be put into the hands of everybody let every one interpret them for himself according to the light he has let there be private judgment let spiritual liberty be revived as in apostolic days then only will the people be emancipated from the middle ages and arise in their power and majesty and obey the voice of enlightened conscience and be true to their convictions and practice the virtues which christianity commands and obey god rather than man and defy all sorts of persecution and martyrdom having a serene faith in those blessed promises which the gospel unfolds then will the people become great after the conflicts of generations and put under their feet the mockeries and lies and despotisms which grind them to despair thus was born the third great idea of the reformation out of luther's brain a logical sequence from the first idea the right of private judgment religious liberty call it what you will a great inspiration which in after times was destined to march triumphantly over battlefields and give dignity and power to the people and lead to the reception of great truths obscured by priests for one thousand years 
the motive of an irresistible popular progress planting england with puritans and scotland with heroes and france with martyrs and north america with colonists yea kindling a fervid religious life creating such men as knox and latimer and taylor and baxter and howe who owed their greatness to the study of the scriptures at last put into every hand and scattered far and wide even to india and china can anybody doubt the marvellous progress of protestant nations in consequence of the translation and circulation of the scriptures how these are bound up with their national life and all their social habits and all their religious aspirations how they have elevated the people ten hundred millions of times more than the boasted renaissance which sprang from apostate and infidel and pagan italy when she dug up the buried statues of greece and rome and revived the literature and arts which soften but do not save for private judgment and religious liberty mean nothing more and nothing less than the unrestricted perusal of the scriptures as the guide of life this right of private judgment on which luther was among the first to insist and of which certainly he was the first great champion in europe was in that age a very bold idea as well as original it flattered as well as stimulated the intellect of the people and gave them dignity it gave to the reformation its popular character it appealed to the mind and heart of christendom it gave consolation to the peasantry of europe for no family was too poor to possess a bible the greatest possible boon and treasure read and pondered in the evening after hard labors and bitter insults read aloud to the family circle with its inexhaustible store of moral wealth its beautiful and touching narratives its glorious poetry its awful prophecies its supernal counsels its consoling and emancipating truths so tender and yet so exalting raising the soul above the grim trials of toil and poverty into the realms of seraphic peace and boundless joy the bible even gave hope to heretics all sects and parties could take shelter under it all could stand on the broad platform of religion and survey from it the wonders and glories of god at last men might even differ on important points of doctrine and worship and yet be protestants religious liberty became as wide in its application as the unity of the church it might create sects but those sects would be all united as to the value of the scriptures and their cardinal declarations on this broad basis john milton could shake hands with john knox and john locke with richard baxter and oliver cromwell with queen elizabeth and lord bacon with william penn and bishop butler with john wesley and jonathan edwards with dr channing this idea of private judgment is what separates the catholics from the protestants not most ostensibly but most vitally many are the catholics who would accept luther's idea of grace since it is the idea of saint augustine and of the supreme authority of the scriptures since they were so highly valued by the fathers but few of the catholic clergy have ever tolerated religious liberty that is the interpretation of the scriptures by the people for it is a vital blow to their supremacy their hierarchy and their institutions they will no more readily accept it than william the conqueror would have accepted the magna carta for the free circulation and free interpretation of the scriptures are the charter of human liberties fought for at leipzig by gustavus adolphus at ivory by henry the fourth this right of worshiping god according to the dictates of conscience enlightened by the free reading of the scriptures is just what the invincible armada was sent by philip the second to crush just what alva dictated by rome sought to crush in holland just what louis the fourteenth instructed by the jesuits did crush out in france by the revocation of the edict of nantes the satanic hatred of this right was the cause of most of the martyrdoms and persecutions of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries it was the declaration of this right which emancipated europe from the dogmas of the middle ages the thraldom of rome and the reign of priests why should not protestants of every shade cherish and defend the sacred right this is what made luther the idol and oracle of germany the admiration of half europe the pride and boast of succeeding ages the eternal hatred of rome not his religious experiences not his doctrine of justification by faith but the emancipation he gave to the mind of the world this is what peculiarly stamps luther as a man of genius and of that surprising audacity and boldness which only great geniuses events when they follow out the logical sequence of their ideas and penetrate at a blow the hardened steel of volcanic armor beneath which the adversary boasts great was the first leo when from his rifled palace on one of the devastated hills of rome he looked out upon the christian world pillaged sacked overrun with barbarians full of untold calamities order and law crushed literature and art prostrate justice a byword 
murders and assassinations unavenged central power destroyed vice in all its enormities vulgarities and obscenities rampant and multiplying itself false opinions gaining ground soldiers turned into banditti and senators into slaves women shrieking in terror bishops praying in despair barbarism everywhere paganism in danger of being revived a world disordered forlorn and dismal pandemonium let loose with howling and shouting and screaming in view of the desolation predicted alike by jeremy the prophet and the cumaean sibyl great was that leo when in view of all this he said with old patrician heroism i will revive government once more upon this earth not by bringing back the caesars but by declaring a new theocracy by making myself the vice-regent of christ by virtue of the promise made to peter whose successor i am in order to restore law punish crime head off heresy encourage genius conserve peace heal dissensions protect learning appealing to love but ruling by fear who but the church can do this a theocracy will create a new civilization not a diadem but a tiara will i wear the symbol of universal sovereignty before which barbarism shall flee away and happiness be restored once more as he sent out his legates he fulminated his bulls and established tribunals of appeal he made a network of ecclesiastical machinery and proclaimed the dangers of eternal fire and brought kings and princes before him on their knees the barbaric world was saved but greater than leo was luther when outraged by the corruptions of this spiritual despotism and all the false and pagan notions which had crept into theology obscuring the light of faith and creating an intolerable bondage and opposing the new spirit of progress which science and art and industry and wealth had invoked he courageously yet modestly comes forward as the champion of a new civilization and declares with trumpet tones let there be private judgment liberty of conscience the right to read and interpret scripture in spite of priests so that men may think for themselves not only on the doctrines of eternal salvation but on all the questions to be deduced from them or interlinked with the past or present or future institutions of the world then shall arise a new creation from dreaded destruction and emancipated millions shall be filled with an unknown enthusiasm and advance with the new weapons of reason and truth from conquering to conquer until all the strongholds of sin and satan shall be subdued and laid triumphantly at the foot of his throne whose right it is to reign thus far luther has appeared as a theologian a philosopher a man of ideas a man of study and reflection whom the catholic church distrusts and fears as she always has distrusted genius and manly independence but he is henceforth to appear as a reformer a warrior to carry out his idea and also to defend himself against the wrath he has provoked impelled step by step to still bolder aggressions until he attacks those venerable institutions which he once respected all the frauds and inventions of medieval despotism all the machinery by which europe had been governed for one thousand years yea the very throne of the pope himself whom he defies whom he insults and against whom he urges christendom to rebel as a combatant a warrior a reformer his person and character somewhat change he is coarser he is more sensual looking he drinks more beer he tells more stories he uses harder names he becomes arrogant dogmatic he dictates and commands he quarrels with his friends he is imperious he fears nobody and is scornful of old usages he marries a nun he feels that he is a great leader in general and wields new powers he is an executive and administrative man for which his courage and insight and will and herculean physical strength wonderfully fit him the man for the times the man to head a new movement the forces of an age of protest and rebellion and conquest how can i compress into a few sentences the demolitions and destructions which this indignant and irritated reformer now makes in germany where he is protected by the elector from papal vengeance before the reconstruction the old rubbish must be cleared away and augean stables must be cleansed he is now at issue with the whole catholic regime and the whole catholic world abuse him they call him a glutton a wine-bibber an adulterer a scoffer an atheist an imp of satan and he calls the pope the scarlet mother of abominations antichrist babylon that age is prodigal in offensive epithets kings and prelates and doctors alike use hard words they are like angry children and women and pugilists their vocabulary of abuse is amusing and inexhaustible see how prodigal shakespeare and ben jonson are in the language of vituperation 
but they were all defiant and fierce for the age was rough and earnest the pope in wrath hurls the old weapons of the gregories and the clements but they are impotent as the darts of priam luther laughs at them and burns the papal bull before a huge concourse of excited students and shopkeepers and enthusiastic women he severs himself completely from rome and declares an unextinguishable warfare he destroys and breaks up the ceremonies of the mass he pulls down the consecrated altars with their candles and smoking incense and vessels of silver and gold since they are the emblems of jewish and pagan worship he tears off the vestments of priests with their embroideries and their gildings and their millineries and their laces since these are made to impose on the imagination and appeal to the sense he breaks up monasteries and convents since they are dens of infamy cages of unclean birds nurseries of idleness and pleasure abodes at the best of narrow-minded ascetic asiatic recluses who rejoice in penance and self-expiation and other modes of propitiating the deity like sufists and fakirs and brahminical devotees in defiance of the most sacred of the institutions of the middle ages he openly marries catherine bora and sets up a hilarious household and yet an household of prayer and singing he abolishes the old gregorian service and for medieval chants monotonous and gloomy he prepares hymns and songs not for boys and priests to intone in the distant choir but for the whole congregation to sing inspired by the melodies of david and the exulting praises of a savior who redeems from darkness into light how grand that hymn of his a mighty fortress is our god a bulwark never failing he makes worship more heartfelt revives apostolic usages preaching and exhortation and instruction from the pulpit a forgotten power he appeals to reason rather than sense denounces superstitions while he rebukes sins and kindles a profound fervor based on the recognition of new truths he is not fully emancipated from the traditions of the past for he retains the doctrine of transubstantiation and keeps up the holidays of the church and allows recreation on the sabbath but what he thinks the most of is the circulation of the scriptures among plain people so he translates them into german a gigantic task and this work almost single-handed is done so well that it becomes the standard of the german language as the bible of tyndale helped to form the english tongue and not only so but it has remained the common version in use throughout germany even as the authorized king james version made nearly a century later by the labor of many scholars and divines has remained the standard english bible moreover he finds time to make liturgies and creeds and hymns and to write letters to all parts of christendom a jerome a chrysostom and an augustine united a kind of protestant pope to whom everybody looks for advice and consolation what a wonderful man no wonder the germans are so fond of him and so proud of him a briarius with a hundred arms a marvel a wonder a prodigy of nature the most gifted versatile hard-working man of his century or nation at last this great theologian this daring innovator is summoned by imperial not papal authority before the diet of the empire at worms where the emperor the great charles v presides amid bishops princes cardinals legates generals and dignitaries thither luther must go yet under imperial safe conduct and consummate his protests and perhaps offer up his life painters poets historians have made that scene familiar the most memorable in the life of luther as well as one of the grandest spectacles of the age i need not dwell on that exciting scene where in the presence of all that was illustrious and powerful in germany this defenseless doctor dares to say to supremest temporal and spiritual authority unless you confute me by arguments drawn from scripture i cannot and will not recant anything here i stand i cannot otherwise god help me amen how superior to galileo and other scientific martyrs he is not afraid of those who can kill only the body he is afraid only of him who hath power to cast both soul and body into hell so he stands as firm as the eternal pillars of justice and his cause is gained what if he did not live long enough to accomplish all he designed what if he made mistakes and showed in his career many of the infirmities of human nature what if he cared very little for pictures and statues the revived arts of greece and rome the pagan renaissance in which he only sees infidelity levities and luxuries and other abominations which excited his disgust and abhorrence when he visited italy 
he seeks not to amuse and adorn the papal empire but to reform it as paul before him sought to plant new sentiments and ideas in the roman world indifferent to the arts of greece and even to the beauties of nature in his absorbing desire to convert men to christ and who since paul has rendered greater service to humanity than luther the whole race should be proud that such a man has lived we will not follow the great reformer to the decline of his years we will not dwell on his subsequent struggles and dangers his marvellous preservation his personal habits his friendships and his hatreds his joys and sorrows his bitter alienations his vexations his disappointments his gloomy anticipations of approaching strife his sickened yet exultant soul his last days of honour and of victory his final illness and his triumphant death in the town where he was born it is his legacy that we are concerned in the inheritance he left to succeeding generations the perpetuated ideas of the reformation which he worked out in anguish and in study and which we will not let die but will cherish in our memories and our hearts as among the most precious of the heirlooms of genius susceptible of boundless application and it is destined to grow brighter and richer in spite of counter-reformation and jesuitism of pagan levities and pagan lies of boastful science and epicurean pleasures of material glories of dissensions and sects and parties as the might and majesty of ages coursing round the world regenerates institutions and nations and proclaims the sovereignty of intelligence the glory and the power of god authorities ranks reformation in germany Daubigine's History of the Reformation, Luther's Letters, Mosheim's History of the Church, Melanchthon's Life of Luther, Erasmi Epistole, Encyclopedia Britannica. End of section 13. Section 14 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 6, Renaissance and Reformation, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Thomas Cranmer, Part 1. A.D. 1489 to 1556. The English Reformation. As the great interest of the Middle Ages, in an historical point of view, centers around the throne of the popes, so the most prominent subject of historical interest in our modern times is the revolt from their almost unlimited domination the protestant reformation in its various relations was a movement of transcendent importance the history of christendom in a moral a political a religious a literary and a social point of view for the last three hundred years cannot be studied or comprehended without primary reference to that memorable revolution we have seen how that great insurrection of human intelligence was headed in germany by luther and we shall shortly consider it in switzerland and france under calvin we have now to contemplate the movement in england the most striking figure in it was doubtless thomas cranmer archbishop of canterbury although he does not represent the english reformation in all its phases he was neither so prominent nor so great a man as luther or calvin or even knox but taking him all in all he was the most illustrious of the christian reformers and he more than any other man gave direction to the spirit of reform which had been quietly working ever since the time of wycliffe especially among the humbler classes the english reformation the way to which had been long preparing began in the reign of henry the eighth and this unscrupulous and tyrannical monarch without being a religious man gave the first great impulse to an outbreak the remote consequences of which he did not anticipate and with which he had no sympathy he rebelled against the authority of the pope without abjuring the roman catholic religion either as to dogmas or forms in fact the first great step towards reform was made not by cranmer but by thomas cromwell earl of essex as the prime minister of henry the eighth a man of whom we really know the least of all the very great statesmen of english history it was he who demolished the monasteries and made war on the whole monastic system and undermined the papal power in england and swept away many of the most glaring of those abuses which disgraced the papal empire armed with the powers which wolseley had wielded he directed them into a totally different channel so far as the religious welfare of the nation is considered although in his principles of government he was as absolute as richelieu like the great french statesman he exalted the throne but unlike him he promoted the personal reign of the sovereign he served with remarkable ability and devotion 
thomas cromwell the prime minister of henry the eighth after the fall of wolseley was born in humble ranks and was in early life a common soldier in the wars of italy then a clerk in a mercantile house in antwerp then a wool merchant in middleborough then a member of parliament and was employed by wolsey in suppressing some of the smaller monasteries his fidelity to his patron wolsey at the time of that great cardinal's fall attracted the special notice of the king who made him royal secretary in the house of commons he made his fortune by advising henry to declare himself head of the english church when he was entangled in the difficulties growing out of the divorce of catherine this advice was given with the patriotic view of making the royal authority superior to that of the pope in church patronage and of making england independent of rome the great scandal of the times was the immoral lives of the clergy especially of the monks and the immunities they enjoyed they were a hindrance to the royal authority and weakened the resources of the country by the excessive drain of gold and silver sent to rome to replenish the papal treasury cromwell would make the clergy dependent on the king and not on the pope for their investitures and promotions and he abominated the idle and vagabond lives of the monk who had degenerated in england perhaps more than in any other country in europe in consequence of the great wealth of their monasteries he was able to render his master and the kingdom of great service from the powers lavished upon him he presided at convocations as the king's vice-regent controlled the house of commons and was inquisitor general of the monasteries he was foreign and home secretary vicar general and president of the star chamber or privy council the proud nevilles the powerful percies and the noble courtenays all bowed before this plebeian son of a mechanic who had arisen by force of genius and lucky accidents too wise to build a palace like hampton court but not ecclesiastical enough in his sympathies to found a college like christ's church as wolsey did he was a man simple in his tastes and hard-working like colbert the great finance minister of france under louis the fourteenth whom he resembled in his habits and policy his great task as well as his great public service was the visitation and suppression of monasteries he perceived that they had fulfilled their mission that they were no longer needed that they had become corrupt and too corrupt to be reformed that they were no longer abodes of piety or beehives of industry or nurseries of art or retreats of learning that their wealth was squandered that they upheld the arm of a foreign power that they shielded offenders against the laws that they encouraged vagrancy and extortion that in short they were nests of unclean birds the monks and friars opposed the new learning now extending from italy to france to germany and to england collet came back from italy not to teach platonic mysticism but to unlock the scriptures in the original the centre of a group of scholars at oxford of whom erasmus and thomas more stood in the foremost rank before the close of the fifteenth century it is said that ten thousand editions of various books had been printed in different parts of europe all the latin authors and some of the greek were accessible to students tunstall and latimer were sent to padua to complete their studies fox bishop of winchester established a greek professorship at oxford it was an age of enthusiasm for reviving literature which however received in germany through the influence chiefly of luther a different direction from what it received in italy and which extended from germany to england but to this awakened spirit the monks presented obstacles and discouragements they had no sympathy with progress they belonged to the dark ages they were hostile to the circulation of the scriptures they were peddlers of indulgences and relics impostors frauds vagabonds gluttons worldly sensual and avaricious so notoriously corrupt had monasteries become that repeated attempts had been made to reform them but without success as early as fourteen eighty nine innocent the seventh had issued a commission for a general investigation the monks were accused of dilapidating public property of frequenting infamous places of stealing jewels from consecrated shrines in fifteen eleven archbishop warham instituted another visitation in fifteen twenty three cardinal wolsey himself undertook the task of reform at last the parliament in fifteen thirty five appointed cromwell vicar or visitor general issued a commission and entrusted it to lawyers not priests who found that the worst had not been told it was found that two-thirds of the monks of england were living in concubinage that their lands were wasted and mortgaged and their houses falling into ruins they found the abbot of fountains surrounded with more women than mohammed allowed his followers and the nuns of lichfield scandalously immoral on this report the lords and commons deliberately not rashly 
decreed the suppression of all monasteries the income of which was less than two hundred pounds a year and the sequestration of their lands to the king about two hundred of the lesser convents were thus suppressed and the monks turned adrift yet not entirely without support this spoliation may have been a violation of the rights of property but the monks had betrayed their trusts the next parliament completed the work in 1539 all the religious houses were suppressed both great and small such venerable and princely retreats as st albans glastonbury beading bury st edmunds and westminster which had flourished one thousand years founded long before the conquest shared the common ruin these probably would have been spared had not the first suppression filled the country with traitors the great insurrection in lincolnshire which shook the foundation of the throne the intrigues of cardinal pole the cornish conspiracy in which the great houses of neville was implicated and various other agitations were all fomented by the angry monks rapacity was not the leading motive of henry or his minister but the public welfare the measure of suppression and sequestration was violent but called for cromwell put forth no such sophistical pleas as those revolutionists who robbed the french clergy that their property belonged to the nation in france the clergy were despoiled not because they were infamous but because they were rich in england the monks may have suffered injustice from the severity of their punishment but no one now doubts that punishment was deserved nor did henry retain all the spoils himself he gave away the abbey lands with a prodigality equal to his rapacity he gave them to those who upheld his throne as a reward for service or loyalty they were given to a new class of statesmen who led the popular party like the fitzwilliams the russells the dudleys and the seymours and thus became the foundation of their great estates they were also distributed to many merchants and manufacturers who had been loyal to the government from one-thirds to two-thirds of the landed property of the kingdom as variously estimated thus changed hands it was an enormous confiscation nearly as great as that made by william the conqueror in favor of his army of invaders it must have produced an immense impression on the mind of europe it was almost as great a calamity to the catholic church of england as the emancipation of slaves was to their southern masters in our late war such a spoliation of the church had not before taken place in any country of europe how great an evil the monastic system must have been regarded by parliament to warrant such an act had it not been popular there would have been discontents amounting to a general to the throne it must also be borne in mind that this dissolution of the monasteries this attack on the monastic system was not a religious movement fanned by reformers but an act of parliament at the insistence of a royal minister it was not done under the direction of a protestant king for henry was never a protestant but as a public measure in behalf of morality and for reasons of state it is true that henry had by his marriage with anne boleyn and the divorce of his virtuous queen defied the pope and separated england from rome so far as appointments to ecclesiastical benefices are concerned but in offending the pope he also equally offended charles v the results of his separation from rome during his life were purely political the king did not give up the mass or the roman communion or the roman dogmas of faith he only prepared the way for reform in the next reign he only intensified the hatred between the old conservative party and the party of reform and progress how far cromwell himself was a protestant it is difficult to tell doubtless he sympathized with the new religious spirit of the age but he did not openly avow the faith of luther he was the able and unscrupulous minister of an absolute monarch bent on sweeping away abuses of all kinds but with the idea of enlarging the royal authority as much perhaps as promoting the prosperity of the realm he therefore turned his attention to the ecclesiastical courts which from the time of becket had been antagonistic to royal encroachments the war between the civil power and these courts had begun before the fall of wolseley and had resulted in the curtailment of probate duties legacies and mortuaries by which the clergy had been enriched a limitation of pluralities and enforcement of residence had also been effected but a still greater blow to the privileges of the clergy was struck by the parliament under the influence of cromwell who had elevated it in order to give legality to the despotic measures of the crown and in this way a law was passed so that no one under the rank of a subdeacon if convicted of felony should be allowed to plead his benefit of clergy but should be punished like ordinary criminals thus re-establishing the constitutions of clarendon in the time of becket another act was also passed by which no one could be summoned as aforetime to the archbishop's court out of his own diocese 
a very beneficent act since the people had been needlessly subject to great expense and injustice in being obliged to travel considerable distances it was moreover enacted that men could not burden their estates beyond twenty years by providing priests to sing masses for their souls the parliament likewise abolished annats a custom which had long prevailed in europe which required one year's income to be sent to the pope on any new preferment a great burden to the clergy a sort of tribute to a foreign power within fifty years one hundred and sixty thousand pounds had thus been sent from england to rome from this one source of papal revenue alone equal to three million pounds at present time or fifteen millions of dollars from a country of only three millions of people it was the passage of that act which induced sir thomas more a devoted catholic but a just and able and incorruptible judge to resign the seals which he had so long and honorably held the most prominent man in england after cromwell and cranmer and it was the execution of this lofty character because he held out against the imperious demands of henry which is the greatest stain upon this monarch's reign parliament also called the clergy to account for excessive acts of despotism and subjected them to the penalty of a premier the offence of bringing a foreign authority into england from which they were freed only by enormous fines thus it would seem that many abuses were removed by cromwell and the parliament during the reign of henry the eighth which may almost be considered as reforms of the church itself the authority of the church was not attacked still less its doctrine but only abuses and privileges the restraint of which was of public benefit and which tended to reduce the power of the clergy it was this reduction of clerical usurpations and privileges which is the main feature in the legislation of henry the eighth so far as it pertained to the church it was wresting away the power which the clergy had enjoyed from the days of alfred and ina a reform which henry the second and edward the first and other sovereigns had failed to effect this was the great work of cromwell and in it he had the support of his royal master since it was a transfer of power from the clergy to the throne and henry the eighth was hated and anathematized by rome as henry the fourth of germany was without ceasing to be a catholic he even retained the title of defender of the faith which had been conferred upon him by the pope for his opposition to the theological doctrines of luther which he never accepted and which he always detested cromwell did not long survive the great services he rendered to his king and the nation in the height of his power he made a fatal mistake he deceived the king in regard to anne of cleves whose marriage he favored from motives of expediency and a manifest desire to promote the protestant cause he palmed upon the king a woman who could not speak a word of english a woman without graces or accomplishments who was absolutely hateful to him henry's disappointment was bitter and his vengeance was unrelenting the enemies of cromwell soon took advantage of this mistake the great duke of norfolk head of the catholic party accused him at the council board of high treason two years before such a charge would have received no attention but henry now hated him and was resolved to punish him for the wreck of his domestic happiness cromwell was hurried to that gloomy fortress whose outlet was generally the scaffold he was denied even the form of a trial a bill of attainder was hastily passed by the parliament he had ruled only one person in the realm had the courage to intercede for him and this was cranmer archbishop of canterbury but his entreaties were futile the fallen minister had no chance of life and no one knew it so well as himself even a trial would have availed nothing nothing could have availed him he was a doomed man so he bade his foes make quick work of it and quick work was made in eighteen days from his arrest thomas cromwell earl of sussex knight of the garter grand chamberlain lord privy seal vicar general and master of the wards ascended to the scaffold on which had been shed the blood of a queen making no protestation of innocence but simply committing his soul to jesus christ in whom he believed like wolsey he arose from a humble station to the most exalted position the king could give and like wolsey he saw the vanity of delegated power as soon as he offered the source of power he who ascends the mountain tops shall find the loftiest peak most wrapped in clouds and storms though high above the sun of glory shines and far beneath the earth and ocean spread round him are icy rocks and loudly blow contending tempests on his naked head on the disappearance of cromwell from the stage cranmer came forward more prominently he was a learned doctor in that university which has ever sent forth the apostles of great emancipating movements he was born in fourteen eighty nine and was therefore twenty years of age on the accession of henry the eighth in fifteen o nine and was twenty-eight when luther published his theses 
he early sympathized with the reform doctrines but was too politic to take an active part in their discussion he was a moderate calm scholarly man not a great genius or great preacher he had none of those bold and dazzling qualities which attract the gaze of the world we behold in him no fearless and impetuous luther attacking with passionate earnestness the corruptions of rome bracing himself up to revolutionary assaults undaunted before kings and councils and giving no rest to his hands or slumber to his eyes until he had consummated his protests a man of the people yet a dictator to princes we see no severely logical calvin pushing out his metaphysical deductions until he had chained the intellect of his party to a system of incomparable grandeur and yet of repulsive austerity exacting all well the same allegiance to doctrines which he deduced from the writings of paul as he did to the direct declarations of christ next to thomas aquinas the acutest logician the church has known a system maker like the great dominican schoolmen and their common master and oracle saint augustine of hippo we see in cranmer no uncompromising and aggressive reformer like knox controlling by a stern dogmatism both a turbulent nobility and an uneducated people and filling all classes alike with inextinguishable hatred of everything that even reminded them of rome nor do we find in cranmer the outspoken and hearty eloquence of latimer appealing to the people at st paul's cross to shake off all the trappings of the scarlet mother who had so long bewitched the world with her sorceries cranmer if less eloquent less fearless less logical less able than these was probably broader more comprehensive in his views adapting his reforms to the circumstances of the age and country and to the genius of the english mind hence his reforms if less brilliant were more permanent he framed the creed that finally was known as the thirty-nine articles and was the true founder of the english church as that church has existed for more than three centuries neither roman nor puritan but halfway between rome and geneva a compromise and yet a church of great vitality and endeared to the hearts of the english people northern germany the scene of the stupendous triumphs of luther is and has been since the time of frederick the great the hotbed of rationalistic inquiries and the genevan as well as the french and swiss churches which calvin controlled have become cold with a dreary formal protestantism without poetry or life but the church of england has survived two revolutions and all the changes of human thought and is still a mighty power decorous beautiful conservative yet open to all the liberalizing influences of an age of science and philosophy cranmer though a scholastic seems to have perceived that nothing is more misleading and uncertain and unsatisfactory than any truth pushed out to its severest logical conclusions without reference to other truths which have for their support the same divine authority it is not logic which has built up the most enduring institutions but common sense and plain truths and appeals to human consciousness the cogito ergo sum without whose approval most systems have perished in mediis tutuissimus ibis is not indeed an agreeable maxim to zealots and partisans and dialectical logicians but it seems to be induced from the varied experiences of human life and the history of different ages and nations and applies to all the mixed sciences like government and political economy as well as to church institutions as cromwell made his fortune by advising the king to assume the headship of the church in england so cranmer's rise is to be traced to his advice to henry to appeal to the decisions of universities whether or not he could be legally divorced from catherine since the pope true to the traditions of the catholic church or from fear of charles v would not grant a dispensation all this business was a miserable quibble a tissue of scholastic technicalities but it answered the ends of cranmer the schools decided for the king and a great injustice and heartless cruelty was done to a worthy and loyal woman and a great insult offered to the church and the emperor charles of germany who was a nephew of the spanish princess and english queen this scandal resulted in a separation from rome as was foreseen both by cromwell and cranmer and the latter became archbishop of canterbury a prelate whose power and dignity were greater then than at the present day exalted as the post is even now the highest in dignity and rank to which a subject can aspire higher even than the lord high chancellorship both of which however pale before the position of a prime minister so far as power is concerned the separation from rome the suppression of the monasteries and the curtailment of the powers of the spiritual courts were the only reforms of note during the reign of henry the eighth unless we name also the new translation of the bible authorized with cranmer's influence and the teaching of the creed the commandments and the lord's prayer in english 
The king died in 1547. Cranmer was now 57 and was left to prosecute reforms in his own way as president of the Council of Regency. Edward the Sixth, being but nine years old, a learned boy as Macaulay calls him, but still a boy in the hands of the great noblemen who composed the Regency, and who belonged to the progressive school. I do not think the career of Cranmer during the life of Henry is sufficiently appreciated. He must have shown at least extraordinary tact and wisdom, with his reforming tendencies and enlightened views, not to come in conflict with his sovereign as Becket did with Henry the Second he had to deal with the most capricious and jealous of tyrants cruel and unscrupulous when crossed a man who rarely retained a friendship or remembered a service who never forgave an injury or forgot an affront a glutton and a sensualist although prodigal with his gifts social in his temper enlightened in his government and with very respectable abilities and very considerable theological knowledge this hard and exacting master cranmer had to serve without exciting his suspicions or coming in conflict with him so that he seemed politic and vacillating for which he would not be excused were it not for his subsequent services and his undoubted sincerity and devotion to the protestant cause during the life of henry we can scarcely call cranmer a reformer the most noted reformer of the day was old hugh latimer the king's chaplain who declaimed against sin with the zeal and fire of Savonarola, and aimed to create a religious life among the people from whom he sprung and whom he loved, a rough, hearty, honest, conscientious man, with deep convictions and lofty soul. In later reforms thus carried on, we perceive that, though popular, they emanated from princes and not from the people. The people had no hand in the changes made, as at Geneva, only the ministers of kings and great public functionaries and in the reforms subsequently effected, which really constitute the English Reformation, they were made by the Council of Regency under the leadership of Cranmer and the protectorship of Somerset. The first thing which the government did after the accession of Edward VI was to remove images from the churches as a form of idolatry, much to the wrath of Gardiner, Bishop of Winchester, the ablest man of the old conservative and papal party. But Ridley, afterwards Bishop of Rochester, preached against all forms of papal superstition with so much ability and zeal that the churches were soon cleared of these helps to devotion. End of section 14.